I am happy to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is going to be Daniel Valle from Writer Affiliated Companies. So with that, um, once again, thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, Daniel, thank you for joining us. Um, we're excited to hear your presentation. So let me go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Brandon. Hi, everyone. Um, as Brandon just mentioned, if you have any questions, please um, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll address them at the at the end of the presentation. Um, and well, just uh, first of all, a little introduction about myself at Writer. So I am the global FP&A manager at Writer Affiliated Companies. Um, now, first of all, quick introduction about uh, what Writer is. So Writer, it's a berry producing company um, that produces uh, four different kinds of berries. So strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, and blueberries. And we are distributed across different regions in the world. So uh, as you will see here, we're in Canada, California, Florida, uh, Mexico, Europe and Africa, and as recently China. So across all these different regions, we have three different FPNA teams that uh, service a total of 20,000 acres and uh, there's different kinds of uh, business models. We have, you know, wholly owned operations. We have independent growers. We have some partners who are working in these regions. So this kind of helps give out uh, some information on the complexity of the of the business. Um, so the model or the project that I was that that, that I will present in this, um, it's a uh, it's a debt plan, a bank debt planning model. So and and forecasting at the same time. So we start this with a problem statement, which uh, was based on our on our monthly forecast process. So the problem statement, as I would say, it is uh, is that as I explained before, we have three different FP&A teams separated in many different regions under a total of about 70, 70 different entities where our forecast relies on individual reporting from these different regions. Now, uh, my role my role or my team's role as the, glo as the global FP&A team, it was to consolidate this information for, um, uh, to present it to leadership and, and provide a context on what's to come in the, in the upcoming months. But the problem was that this consolidation was happening only for the revenue, gross profit, and PVT numbers. We didn't really have a single source of truth whenever we had these questions about um, going into the forecast. We didn't really have the ability to do multiple scenarios. And uh, we also focus uh, heavily on forecasting the PL, but we didn't have a clear view of the bank debt, the cash flows, ratios, or uh, even the business drivers. So based upon these, the team, uh, the teams got together and uh, we proposed the following solution. So first of all, is we recognized that the work, the forecasting work was being done. That was happening, but um, the consolidation process needed some work. So we decided to take all the work that was already being done by the different regions. We created a model and a process to consolidate this work. And then we use this consolidating information to eventually produce a balance sheet and a statement of cash flows. From there, we also had that information available to, to get the business drivers or the operating drivers in order to, to produce the MDNAs and actually get a, a very clear sense of uh, what has happened so far and what was about to happen. Um, and I will get more in detail about this, but you know, we got a good sense of you know, maybe we're going to have some volume misses or maybe price is going to come down. Um, we were also able to create a scenario management matrices in order to adjust these drivers and run multiple scenarios. So meaning, you know, what if actually price didn't come down that hard or, you know, we had some expectations on maybe some some plans some some actual plans were not 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 we're going to we were not going to be able to plan some of the stuff that we had in our original budget so you know we were able to to adjust those kind of things 
and obviously this had a this this has an impact on the investment and the debt levels and we were we were, we wanted to be able to recognize that uh, and lastly, we are we were able to implement the data push capabilities of Quantrix uh, to push this data into data warehouses uh, that we could then use for standard reporting and ongoing reporting for the leadership and the operating units. From here, um, we map the process down, and this is a uh, this is an extremely summarized version of that uh, of that process map. But as you will see, the, pro uh, the previous process was we had these different data inputs coming from both Excel and Quantrix, where in the US and Canada regions, we were able to implement Quantrix for them. Well, we implemented Quantrix for the most part uh, uh, on the prior state, but still Mexico, um, Europe and Africa, we were still getting information from, from Excel sheets. And then we consolidated, we consolidated this into our global reporting, as I mentioned before, only revenue, gross profit, and PVT. After that, we changed the process into full adoption of Quantrix for the forecasting price in US and Canada. Mexico, even though they do a lot of the work in Quantrix, the data input at the very end, we get in a database format from Mexico. And something similar happens for Europe and Africa. Now, the, the here's a here's the main difference. Instead of taking that information straight into just one Excel consolidation sheet, we actually took all this information in a, with a combination of data pushes, data links, copying and pasting, different processes to to get that info that individual information into a Quantrix model where we consolidate our global PNL debt, leverage, ratios, free cash flows, drivers, expected supply, um, and our scenario management. And then from there, we pushed the or we took this information out to Excel in order to create uh, in order to create charts for presentation. You know, we have some standard formattings, you know, uh, corporate colors, corporate co uh, formats that we need to adjust to in order to produce the monthly financial package. So that's why we push the information out to Excel. And then the, the, the other process is we push this information into a data warehouse in order to eventually make it available in Tableau for our standard reporting. the result that we achieved with this is we were able to provide leadership with an ongoing um, with an ongoing look of the company future cash flows and financial results um, but also very importantly we we were able to create these matrices with with summaries on the drivers and investments that allowed us the global fpna team to provide a clear story to leadership on what were those driving factors. Uh, and, you know, we we actually found out um, this this year, for example, given the financial results and, and given our, our ability to plan for this debt and the investments, that um, we were actually going to end on a pretty good debt level position where we were we were actually going to be $30 million under budget on the on the bank debt. So now we we were able to focus on like, well, we have this extra capital. How are we going to deploy it? Uh, which is something that we we really struggle in the past because we never really we didn't really have this ability to to act this quickly in terms of um, deploying that capital. Um, another one of the results is because of this consolidation that happened um, across the different regions is uh, we have a single stop or a single source of trade for the global finance team, and then we're also able to run multiple scenarios. Because of these, we were also able to produce a to easily produce a monthly reporting package that's standard um, that the executive team understand that everyone is fully aware of and everyone's familiar with. And uh, sort of a byproduct is um, this did a really good job at allowing us to have historical records. 
and this was super helpful in the sense that whenever we had questions about not only what's going on this year, but also what's been happening in years prior, this almost helped us create that, um, if you want to call it this way, a data warehouse or a data mart where we were able to just go back and look at those prior years and trust that information um, immediately. And these uh, facilitated a lot of uh, a lot of our other processes in the company, such as budgeting and our five year plan, where we thanks to this debt planning model, we were able to execute in this budgeting and five year plan uh, much faster and much more accurately. Um, now this we're going to go. This is just a little introduction of what the, um, what the model was set out to to do. Um, what was the problem statement? We're going to go into the model, but um, just wanted to give this quick snapshot here because um, I think it really presents very well the four key components of um, the four key components of this model or this this project where you can see um, on the top left, we have the driver budget variance where we can see our year to date, our year to date drivers, how we're performing against the budget, then how we're doing on these multiple scenarios, and finally, what's our comparison point at the end to, to the budget at the end of the year. Uh, top right corner, you will see our financial bridges. It's um, it's kind of our, it's kind of our company's personal take on on how we present the variances to the budget what are the main driving components so price volume the acres that are that are in the ground and cost inflation and how this affect the gross profit and then the bottom left corner you will see a high level summary that um it's kind of hard to read at them um, in this slide but basically what we present it's a very high level view of what our revenues are, our PVT number is, our GNA expense, our debt levels, our liabilities to equity ratio, um, investments and stuff. So this is this is really helpful, you know, just to give a quick snapshot, quick little picture that we can just tell people, you know, we're on track on our budget or we need to adjust certain things, and that's where we can dive in into the drivers or we can dive in into some of the other components of the model. And then finally, in the bottom right corner, you will see the scenario management where we can play around with um, at a very granular level um, with the multiple business drivers, make adjustments on a percentage basis and see how that affects the overall high level summary or the bridges and so on. So all of these other all of these matrices are interconnected with each other. So we can run multiple scenarios and see how that affects throughout the entirety of the of the business. Um, quick little view of um, some of the charts and some of the reporting that we're doing as part of the standard process. You know, you see on the left side pretty clearly. You know, we're able to recognize our our performance on PVT. What are our driving factors? Is it the volume? Is it the price? Or is it the cost structure that we have? Uh, that are driving these operating profit and PVT numbers. And to your right, you see some charts on how the different regions or how the different berries are contributing to these results. And, um, you know, it's a nice little quick view that um, thanks to this process, we became, um, all of our users have become pretty familiar with and they're able to recognize pretty quickly. So that's been um, really, really helpful in terms of uh, decision making. So I'm going to go and jump into the model for uh, I'm going to go and jump in the model for for a quick little demo. But uh, the way I constructed this is uh, I wanted to give you I, I want to give the audience uh, what's one potential scenario that we would run. Um, what's one of the potential scenarios that we would run? Running through the model and show you the kind of difference that 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 it makes. So you know, I'm just going to go through the bullets here. So you know, manage, um, and and then we'll see it in the model. So the first point is, uh, we actually had a case this year where management believed that the strawberry uh, pricing in California would actually be closer to budget in the last quarter. Um, then halfway through the year, Florida uh, recasted their forecast volume for the second half of the year. Now, because of timing issues or timing of the process, this hasn't been reflected in the detailed forecast 
just yet. But we have a general idea of what these changes are, and we can go into the model and make some high level assumptions and see what that's going to do. And uh, given these better results, the company would invest some extra capital in replacing some farm equipment and doing some leasehold improvements. So I'm going to jump into the model now and we will see how this scenario, how this scenario one uh, will be reflected in the model. So this is the view that, that I presented back then, you know, the four quadrants if you want. Um, so the first scenario here, as we will see, is we talk about strawberries in California. So we, we talk about the strawberries in California where we actually believe that our, what do we say, the pricing. So we believe that the pricing would be closer to budget. So, you know, we can make some, some adjustments here in the price. You know, um, what I did prior to this, to this uh, presentation is I adjusted the percentages to get us closer to budget. Um, but I want us to focus. I want us to focus our attention on these debt numbers. For example, it's a good place to to focus on. It might be a little too dark. So you know, if I go ahead and change this uh, prior to making these changes, um, we will see our debt number increasing substantially to 101 million because the price at this point in, in November and December were low, far lower than what the budget was expected it to be now because of this business, because of this, of this scenario, we actually believe that it's going to be closer to budget. So that's why we plug these numbers in here and we can get a sense on, you know, this is going to have an effect on the, on the overall revenue on the gross profit and therefore in the debt number. But this is the kind of approach that we would be able to to take for these for these sort of adjustments. And you know, we will see it again in in Florida, for example, too. Where we actually believe our yield was going to be different. And again, what when I say that we recasted the forecast, it's uh, to give you a clear example of this is back then when we had our first version of the forecast we way underestimated the amount of acres that we're going to we were going to plant in the ground so halfway through the year the team got together we we saw some opportunities on on planting more acres getting more plants and again what this model enabled us to do is we were able to see uh, a really good opportunity because we saw the debt levels decreasing because of the really good results and when the opportunity came out to do this extra 100 acres of plantings, we were able to reconcile these two, um, these two factors into, hey, we have this business opportunity and now we can actually see that we can afford it and it's not going to heavily impact our liabilities to equity ratio. So we went ahead and said, yeah, let's let's go ahead and do it. The company can afford it. And, you know, I mean, as you will see here, thanks to that, we we were able to increase our volume substantially which had an impact on the on the debt number as well where before making that adjustment we were at 99.5 million dollars in debt given that adjustment we take our debt number down to 98 even with the extra investment um and finally the third factor that we change here is uh, given the better results we were able to buy some farm equipment so you know we invest in modern capital expenditures Therefore, I could just go to a different matrix where I can make these more high level adjustments and take that CapEx number down, which was about 4 million. So I make the changes here and that has a straight dent into the debt number because as of now, every Every investment or every change that we make at this level, we just make the assumption that goes straight to debt because it just facilitates the conversation that we have internally with our uh, with our leadership team. You know, build a second scenario where basically we were saying that Central Mexico had a very rough first half of the year in the raspberries and management really wanted to understand how much yield we would need to increase on that second half 
to make up to make up for that volume shortfall in the first half of the year. So again, I can just go into this matrix, go into my Central Mexico um, item here, go to my Raspberry product line. I'm gonna go ahead as as you can see here. Um, I have multiple scenarios. I mean, I have the original forecast, and then I have three different scenarios because the truth is that um, we didn't want to overcomplicate this. But if we wanted to, we could add almost as many scenarios as we want, which limit ourselves to three. So based upon this, in order to make up for what Central Mexico uh, lost in the first half of the year, we basically said that we needed about an 18% increase on the, on the yield supply in order to make up for the, for the shortfall. Now, if I clear this out, or actually maybe a better look of this, it's something like this, where we were able to compare side by side. I'm just gonna hide this as well, and this as well. So here where we can where we can uh, hide side by side the um, different scenarios. So I have an original forecast where we said that we we're going to be producing 16,000 kilos for every hectare. Um, where our budget was 17.4. So now basically running these multiple scenarios is just saying, OK, maybe we need to increase by 18 percent on average throughout the rest of the year to make up for that yield shortfall. Now, the the really interesting part about this is the question becomes different. It's no longer how much do we need to increase our yield in order to achieve our goal. Instead, instead it is now can we achieve that 18 percent volume increase? And what are the and then, you know, from here on, we can drive we can dive into uh, more detailed factors such as, you know, what what do we need to do? Do we need to uh, plant different varieties? Do we, do we need do we need to cut them back at a different time and so on? So these are some of the things that have really helped doing um, uh, building this model. And then, you know, on top of this, and I didn't express it in the presentation as early, but some other stuff that we were able to, to build on top of this is our um, pricing structure changed this year, for example, substantially across all the different products in all the different regions. So, you know, it's a very, very, very big change. Um, and we needed to assess what the effect was going to be on. On our profitability. So what we did is we built a whole set of matrices in here where we were able to address that that change in the business model and then you know like get an understanding or is it positive is it negative and so on um and that's uh you know i mean all, all in all i would say that's uh that's the overall purpose of the model and that's how we how we construct it and then you know we have some other places where we can see our our monthly volumes that get pushed into the tableau data warehouse so it gets pushed into the Tableau data warehouse and um, we can analyze other stuff such as the volumes and just give it a different presentation. And then finally, I mean, as I was saying, the volumes is a big component here, our, our supply, we call it our supply curve, where we're interested on in seeing um, the volume that's being provided for each berry across all the different regions. So, you know, we could go ahead and see the different changes instead of just focusing on having this is our revenue this or gross profit and this and pvt we can dive in into more um, operational stuff such as what's going to be our volume supply over the next couple of months for each region which was something that while in the past we were we might have been able to do it it take a considerable amount of time because you needed the user to go into each of the file structures to get that information and then roll it up together. While here, we can straight go into one matrix, look at that forecast, and pretty and, and straight up compare it against the budget. 
and then you know it just opened up the door to to do much more um, detailed analysis and get a very clear picture of, of what's going on in the business. And that's it for my presentation. Short and sweet. I hope so. Great, Please. Thanks, so, thanks much. so much. Yeah, yeah, there are a couple of questions, Daniel, so I can share those with you. Um, so have you considered using cloud for data entry from the various entities regions? Yes, so um, the first couple of years when we adopted Quantrix, it was just used by the FBNA team. So our user base was fairly limited. So we didn't see the need at the at the beginning to to use the cloud service. Now, as of this year, we have expanded the usage across uh, different uh, departments, more specifically uh, the cost accounting team. So you know the cost accounting team may be made up of uh, eight to ten users across different regions that you know they use it to work on their budget. They and they were all doing inputs on the on the same model. And we ran into this trouble where people needed to to go in regularly and make changes and add things and add you know do the data entry for the budget and. Um, well, you know, that's when this year we are basically taking the we're taking into consideration going into the cloud service in order to FPNA team be able to manage and control and create the, the models and then have the accounting team being able to go into the cloud and do the data entry. Awesome. And so we we have a there's a couple others and some of them are overlap a little bit. Um, so I guess to try to kind of um, combine it, can you comment more on how you've used data push is one of them? Is it a vendor SQL database or a tool provided by Tableau? Could you talk a little bit about that and how Tableau relates to Quantrix? I guess it's trying to combine a, a couple things there, but. Yeah, no, for sure. So. The way we've utilized data push is we work internally. We we have worked internally with our IT teams in order to create uh, SQL based tables. Uh, so we use the data push to take the information that's available in the models, push it into these SQL tables that eventually make it to the data warehouse. That's uh, the, the neat thing about that is in order to create these SQL tables, they are completely so they are completely managed and controlled by the FBNA team. Even if we need IT support to create these tables, so um, as you might be, as as all of you may be familiar with, uh, sometimes making these changes on the IT data warehouse take it takes a considerable amount of time because they have to fit the data model of the entire company. And sometimes, whenever you just want to have one big repository of information, it may be slow when you want to to adapt it to the entirety of the business of the data model of the company. So we use data push by working with IT. Let's create this um, set of SQL tables that that the global FPNA manages and and you know designs. And then we use the data push capabilities to push the information into those tables and create this data repository that allows us to combine the data and consolidate it. And then to answer the question about Tableau is again, it's also going the information is the information is also going to the SQL tables that then along with our IT team, we merge that information into the data where the data marts of the reporting package and the reason why we why we do this it's because well there's certain amount of information that's already coming from our company-wide data warehouse and then what we do is we adapt the data pushes to fit that data warehouse so we basically take these two massive amounts of data and put them all together in tableau where we're combining these two sources into one standard package reporting for the enterprise. 
Perfect. And we, we've actually had a few uh, few new ones come in since then. Um, what is the size of the model in terms of cells or formulas? So I guess I think I can show you this. This is by no means the um, this is by no means the biggest model that we have, but this one, just to be specific, it's uh, 173 million cells um, with a total of 1,500 formulas. Um, you know, the biggest model that we have, it's about 1.5 billion cells, and that's our um, that's our budgeting, that's our budgeting model. That's the, I would say that's the largest one. Now, the cool thing about this, I mean, I'm sure you guys have already explained it through, um, you know, between yesterday and today, but the really cool thing about this is, um, even though you see this incredible, incredibly large amount of items, 441, 100,000, all of these are interconnected with each other and they're all connect. So they're all connected to a catalog, if you will. So, you know, the the naming convention of all these different dimensions, such as the districts, the, the berries, the legal entities, all of these are connected not only within the model, but they also have the same naming convention as all of the other models that we have. So it just becomes really powerful when rolling information, uh, when when pushing information across different models, because all of it shares a name, um, and it just facilitates the 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 formula creation process. And so it sounds like obviously you have some very large models, and there's a lot of data there. Um, so one of the questions, kind of building off that, is do you have any tips for organizing your model? How did you structure the folders or matrices? Was there anything that you did specifically that you think might be helpful to other people? For sure. So one thing that I would definitely recommend the team, it's um, um, the data push capability. The, so the combination of data pushes and SQL and SQL tables, it's really, really powerful. So sometimes it really makes sense that if the model is starting to become too large or too unmanageable, I would definitely recommend people to to leverage the capability of doing the data pushes in order to make smaller, more manageable models and then push the data into a consolidation table. That would be a tip number one. It's much better in, in our case, it's worked much better to have agile models that users want to use. And then they can just do the, the data pushes for consolidation. So that would be the first thing. Second tip, it's um, we actually have a model that doesn't do any calculation in particular. The only thing that it does, it's just a catalog. So you will, if I open the model, it would be 80, 90 different matrices that, you know, all of them we call the manager. So, you know, we're going to have a legal entity manager that has a list of all 80 entities and how they're set up. Another one that's going to have a manager for the different, um, what would you say, like the different districts, the different regions, the different countries. And you will find out that as, as you're creating new models, instead of creating new, instead of creating the new matrices from scratch, through the utilization of the data link and connecting to straight up to the model, you will see that by doing it that way, in the long run, it's going to make so much more sense because every every model will have the same naming convention and it's much easier to interconnect the data between them. And the last tip that I have for the group, it's uh, on, on how we construct uh, on how we have constructed the models is. I'm very particular with. Um, you know, um, in indexing the the matrices so you know as i've seen other cases where people have a list of a hundred different matrices and it's kind of hard to follow it's a little overwhelming so i spent a really good amount of time on using the folders you know um i will create a folder for what are my data inputs so you know let's create a, a folder where i'm gonna have all my data inputs and my my data links and all the information that's being retrieved from other places 
let's build a set of matrices that's solely dedicated to making calculations. What are some of the summaries? And then another one for, you know, this is going to be solely used for the scenario management purposes. So these, I really, really think that um, time spent indexing this information like this, it's time very well spent because it's going to save you a lot of time in the future. Great, and then we just have one last one. Um, and I know because the, the last presentation we had, uh, Carlos was talking about how uh, at Uplift utilized consultancy work in, in getting help to build some of the models. So is, have you used any external consultant to help build your models um, at Writer? No, we have not. Uh, so our FP &A, the, the, the way we have a structure this is, um, we we like to have at least one in-house expert in order to do troubleshooting, data modeling, and and trying to come up with these solutions. And then we have passed it down to some other departments, such as I explained before, the cost accounting team, where the cost accounting is really good at doing the data entry. And any kind of question or troubleshooting, they would come back to our FP&A team to answer these questions. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Daniel. That that uh, pretty much wraps up all the questions we had. So uh, I just want to thank you again. This was an awesome presentation. It's really great to learn to see a little bit about your company as well as uh, to see how Quantrix fits in. So